Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Plus podcast, uh, coming to you this time from China. Well, obviously I'm not in China, but my guest is. Uh, Dr. Brian Gu is the Vice Chairman and President of Xpeng Motors, which we have covered on, on the Fully Charged show. Elliot has driven uh, some of their models. In fact, owns one. He owns a, a Xpeng G3. Um, uh, a very new company. 2015, they started. So seven years ago. And they are producing a huge, huge amount of cars that have incredible range. As you will discover, the latest one, an eye-watering recharge speed. Just no one else is anywhere near them. I mean, they are doing incredible, incredible work. They're really an exciting company to uh, to to find out about. And uh, for the last uh, year and a half or so, they've been for sale in Norway. And they've been very popular in Norway. And they are now expanding into Sweden, Denmark and the Netherlands, um, where you'll be able to buy an Xpeng car, which is uh, pretty pretty impressive to have achieved that in such a short time once again they're a startup that hasn't got the legacy of building diesel and petrol engines you know they just make electric cars that's all they've ever done they are now really ramping up their uh, self-driving abilities their autonomous uh, drive abilities that's one of their key things they make all the software and all the hardware and it's integrated together a little bit like another company we know. Uh, and they also run a supercharging network in China at the moment, which obviously is very fast, very reliable, that their cars will plug into very easily. They're well-maintained charging systems. We have a, a brief discussion about the charging network in China, which is hard not to be you know, fairly impressed with what they've achieved in, in the last few years. And the level of sales in China is extraordinary. The amount of electric vehicles they have on their roads is, you know, kind of they're way ahead of anyone else in the world. Um, so that's that's what we're talking about today. Really interesting podcast, really interesting to talk to 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 Brian. He's a he's a very knowledgeable man and they're a very impressive company. Before we start that, I just, well, here's a really important announcement is that when we do, we're doing Fully Charged Live in the UK at the end of April and the beginning of May. There is not going to be an XPeng on display there as far as I know. Who knows? But I'm pretty confident that's not happening. I am much less confident about not having an XPeng on display in Amsterdam in the middle of May when we do our live show in Amsterdam at the Rye. That is is looking extremely, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to make any promises because you know what happens if, you know, when I used to promise my children something and then I couldn't deliver it. Massive disappointment, <laughs> huge resentment. <laughs> so I'm not doing that, but it's certainly looking very possible and we'll certainly be reviewing the um, European versions of the Xpengs when we get the chance, which is looking like very soon. Uh, just before we start, I want to have a quick, uh, let's just have a quick word from our lovely sponsor, My Energy, uh, amazing British company making their products in this country, which is very good. They're employing lots of people. They're growing very quickly. They're a very, very successful, homegrown uh, and, and brilliant uh, technology. My Zappi Charger, fantastic. You can't not love a Zappi Charger. So let's hear from my energy. My energy is putting the I back into British innovation. My energy is putting the I back into inventing the future. My energy is putting the I back into inspiring a nation. Recharging the world with green smart energy. Charge your EV with your PV and more. Visit myenergy.com and help to spark the green revolution. My Energy, driving the charge to a greener future. Well, without more ado, let us welcome Dr. Brian Gu from Xpeng onto the Fully Charged Plus podcast. 
So, Brian, thank you for joining us on the show again. It's really good to have you back because in the time since we last spoke, I know that uh, XPeng has really moved on. I mean, the the key difference, I think, from from our point of view over here is that there are now people in Norway driving XPeng cars, you know, basically outside China, which is yeah. very, very good. So, I mean, can you start off with uh, uh, telling me how that's gone? I mean, how, how the cars have been received there, what, what, what the situation is? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, since we spoke, I think there's a lot of development uh, here at XPeng. Um, you know, we ended the year last year uh, on a high note. Uh, we actually delivered uh, more um, vehicles than any, any other pure play EV companies in China and make us number two wow. in the world behind Tesla in terms of the pure play EV companies. Wow. So that's quite an achievement. Uh, we also, I think, uh, unveiled uh, new products and new technologies uh, in the recent month. Uh, our fourth product, G9, actually has been launched. Um, it will be delivered later this year. Uh, right. with obviously the leading uh, technology on both uh, autonomous driving as well as the charging platform. Right. Um, so, so I think there's a number of exciting uh, developments. And then on the international front, uh, we actually um, have um, yeah, sort of, um, you know, can be, have been selling in Norway since the end of 2020. So yeah. we have all, over a year of uh, sort of a selling um, uh, vehicles in, in Norwegian market. Um, you know, we have sold our G3 uh, and, and also the uh, ran, you know, in, uh, sort of uh, updated G3i version, as well as our P7 uh, in Norway. Um, all of them, I think, uh, have been well received. Uh, we obviously still are in the process of uh, laying the foundation for our uh, European uh, um, strategy, uh, as well as infrastructure for selling and services and charging in Europe. So it's it's going to be a, 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 a you know long term process for us to really you know uh, spend uh, the the effort and resources to develop the European market. Yeah. Uh, we are very excited uh, this year that we will going to have our fourth product, which is the G three that will be launching uh, later uh, in, in, into European market as well. And G9, I'm sorry, G9, G9 will be actually the first product that we developed um, together with you know, both the uh, China and the European specifications uh, in mind. So it's actually right. not a, a updated vehicle. It's actually a brand new vehicle that was international uh, you know, development. So I think right. these are all very exciting you know, sort of areas for us to focus on. And, and, and I think the company will, will have a long-term uh, commitment uh, in terms of uh, these strategic uh, international um, areas. So I think, uh, you know, all that uh, makes us very excited uh, for, you know, obviously 2022 as well. Yeah. I mean, that is, can you just quickly remind our listeners, just because the, the history of XPeng is quite short by in, in comparison with the like long established European and North American brands of cars who've been around sometimes for over a hundred years, you know, yeah. and you have gone from essentially nothing to a really big car company in, I don't even know how many years it is. Not very many. It is an extraordinary yeah. story. So the company started in 2015. So it's wow. about two year, uh, the seven years. Yes. Um, and uh, we're well, certainly not as long as some of the OEMs, but even compared to some of the new energy uh, vehicle and like Tesla, like BYD, uh, we're still very relatively young. But yeah. on the other hand, I think uh, we probably don't have some of the baggages of the large OEMs, you know, they need to obviously, um, you, know, you know, focus on both the, the legacy uh, uh, IC products as well as um, trying to figure out how to do uh, smart EVs. For us, our f very first commitment is actually on smart EVs. And that right. uh, to us is our core strategy and we never waver from that. So, so for us, I think uh, uh, we'll be able to have a very, dedicated effort both in terms of technology design and also manufacturing services uh, to uh, really uh, um, uh, embrace the opportunity here yeah so so it's, I mean let's go back to you know the, um, the, the your position in the Chinese market because the Chinese market is 
you know, mind boggling for people outside China. It is so huge. One, it's such a huge market. And two, there's so many electric cars being sold. I mean, the, the, the sales of electric cars have really grown, haven't they? I mean, all that I was sort of looking up all the reports earlier on today, and I'm just going, oh, I, you know, I, I try and keep up with it. And I hadn't realized quite the scale that it is. So, I mean, I'm presuming you're doing well, you're doing very well in the Chinese market. Yeah, so I think uh, we are uh, currently considered as the leading uh, EV player in the Chinese market. Right, uh, Especially, wow. um, you know, when you're looking at vehicles, not just focus on electrification, uh, we focus on uh, smartification. For example, we develop right. a full stack software for autonomous driving uh, technologies uh, that allow us to have a very high degree of uh, uh, ADAS functions that our drivers can use uh, in their daily uh, drivings. Uh, we also have smart cabin. We have our charging and battery um, you know, management system, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's a lot of technologies that we actually have developed uh, over the years uh, to really differentiate our products versus some of the traditional EV, EV products. And in the long run, we think, uh, you know, purely be a, a just electrified vehicle is not enough. I think you need to yeah. be uh, really uh, uh, differentiated with smart capabilities. And that's the hallmark of our strategy. Right. And so that is something, because that sounds like something you've really been focused on in the last few years is, is to develop the autonomous side of the, of the vehicles. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so autonomous is obviously a very important aspect of smart strat, smart capabilities. Yeah. Um, you know, we have um, you know, from you know very beginning, the 2017, when we started the autonomous driving research group, we wanted to do full stack uh, software development, um, and and that really paid off. You know, as you can see that in in terms of the you know China market, um, you know driving uh, uh, capabilities, we actually stand um, you know compared to you know Tesla and other China EV makers, yeah. we actually compare very favorably with our technology because it's a fully, you know, uh, self-developed, a full stack technology. Uh, most of the players actually use third-party solutions, which does not give them the ability to innovate quickly and yeah. also to uh, really uh, evolve. Um, so I think uh, uh, we have a certain advantage now, given we have been you know, doing the full stack approach for the last yeah. four years. And I mean, it is that it is the, the big unfair advantage that the new companies have over the incumbents, you know, in the, in the fact that you don't have the legacy in your company of, you know, making diesel and petrol engines. You don't have to worry about that. That's not something you do. Right. I mean, I think yeah. the, the legacy pro, you know, uh, uh, products and legacy uh, uh, businesses um, obviously is, you know, profitable, uh, but on the other yeah. hand, it really sucks up a lot of resources and, and people who uh, has been very, you know, for decades focused on that. It's very hard for them to change, to really think about, um, uh, uh, you know, a vehicle in a totally different um, sort of a, uh, a setting. So yeah. that's why I think uh, uh, there will be challenges for OEMs to, to pivot uh, to this new uh, sort of smart EV world. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, we, without the package, will probably have a much more nimbler uh, ability to respond to that opportunity. Yeah. So the, those, the, will all the, the, the newer models you're talking about, I mean, because I'm intrigued that you're not in China at the moment. I believe you're in Thailand. So uh, are you, because uh, I'm, so I'm focused on the European market because, you know, that's where I live. But yeah. are you uh, selling cars in other markets outside China as well? No, I think uh, you know our uh, international strategy will first focus on Europe, um, and I think Europe is a very big market. Um, yeah, we're scrapping the surfaces with Norway and some Nordic regions. Uh, we'll be able to uh, start selling uh, probably uh, very soon uh, in other countries uh, like you know Sweden, Denmark, and Holland. Uh, but we have aspiration for the rest of the large markets in continental Europe. Uh, those are I think the important markets for us to focus on. So I think that will be the first uh, priority is to make sure you know our you know European strategies sound and, and execute right. well. 
Um, and then beyond that, I think uh, we'll obviously look at other markets um, and probably in, in, in a slightly later time frame. Uh, but, you know, we are making right hand driving vehicles. So you can imagine right. so, uh, after the European continental Europe, uh, we may look at some of the larger, more developed uh, right hand driving markets. Uh, we also look at, you know, other emerging markets in, in Middle East and Southeast Asia. Uh, so I think that on sta- in stages, we'll be tackling other, you know, international markets. Uh, but right now, I think our focus is to make sure Europe, uh, we do it right. Uh, we do yeah. have the, the focus and resources to, to, to launch and build our brand. Right. And in terms of charging, as I know we discussed this before, but I mean, that's often a, a key question that our listeners want to know about is, uh, uh, you know, that the speed of charging, the range of the vehicles, the, the development of the battery technology to cope with that. I mean, is that, it sounds like that is something you've been really focused and working on. It is a key part of the, the package that you're offering. Yeah, I think uh, you know, for us, um, you know, the the offering has to be uh, more than just an electrified vehicle, right? Right. I mean, uh, we actually want to make sure people uh, accept us uh, for you know the the design. Uh, we think we build we design very beautiful products. Uh, the performance it, it drives very well in in very different con- in all kinds of conditions and, and has a very good ride. And also the technology, you know, we have so yeah. much technology packed into the product uh, and, and autonomous driving being one. But in addition to that, you know, our smart cabin design, our you know, interface, the voice command, uh, all of that, we want to get, you know, uh, you know the, the consumer a taste of. Yeah. So I think uh, needless to say, we, we have high hopes. Uh, obviously, this will take time uh, because... Uh, we're not going to, you know, have the, all the capabilities transferred, uh, in, you know, 100% to, to the new market. It will take time to, to build that. But I think we, we want to make sure the consumers in, in international markets also can enjoy the same quality, same, you know, beauty and same smartness of our product. Yeah, because, I mean, that's one, the one key thing I've heard from the people we know in Norway is that you know they re- they are really impressed with the build quality of the cars you know that they they're e- extremely good you know they're, they're not sort of yeah so which is so you've done that right <laughs> you've pleased the Norwegians <laughs> which is a very good sign the um but can you would you could you give us a bit of an insight into the the Chinese market in general because that is a thing that fascinates us here because we you know obviously we don't know much about it but is is it a, a a growing? It is still a growing market for electric for all types of vehicles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Chinese market last year has been one of the fastest growing markets in the world for EV. Right. Um, of overall, you know, automobile growth is not there. I mean, it's, it's kind of stagnant because obviously both of the supply chain issues as well as yeah. uh, obviously some of the um, you know product mix shifts. But the EV as a product has grown, you know, um, and the market has grown over 100%. I mean, that's how fast the market has right. grown. Right. Uh, and then we, you know, leading players like, you know, XPEN has been growing close to 300%. Wow. So I think that there's a, you know, significant growth prospect for the Chinese EV market. Um, you know, a year, you know, let's say in 2020, um, when we first IPO'd in the U.S., uh, I think the Chinese government at the time put out a white paper, uh, just say, okay, they expect EV penetration to be close to 20% by 2025. Right. We already achieved that almost in by the end of last year. That wow. was like two okay. years ahead of the schedule. So that's how fast I think the EV adoption and penetration has been uh, for the Chinese market. And I think uh, it's not, you know, cooling down yet i think it's going to continue because yeah. i think what's driving it, it's not the government's putting a lot of the incentive and and, and sort of uh, forces in place it's actually the consumers actually become more and more uh, you know sort of uh, welcoming the uh, um the beautiful the 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 best in the technology and also the 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 cost of uh and the lower cost of driving for ev so it's becoming a mainstream product rather than a niche product uh, for right. Uh, for the population here in China. So I think all that, you know, points to an uh, inflection point that we pretty much reached, uh, you know, recently that, you know, the EV 
and or smart EBI for that matter is going to explode in the next couple or uh, two three years. Yeah, and I mean because that's one thing I don't know about is is that there is a price differentiation then between running. A, a, a gasoline or petrol car in China and running an electric one. It is. It, is it cheaper per kilometer to drive an electric one? Because I, I don't know about the, the energy prices in China. I don't well, know I think the that. electricity is much cheaper than than gasoline. Right. So uh, for the same distance, I think you are looking at eighty percent saving uh, right. on sort of fuel cost or, or energy yeah. cost, uh, and also EVs has a. M- Fewer moving parts, yeah. so you don't need to uh, service and do oil change or, or or that sort of matter. So, so the the ownership cost will be much lower. Uh, right. Obviously, the upfront the uh, build cost for EV for exactly the you know comparable model EV is still slightly more expensive. But if you consider the total ownership cost, I think it's come probably close to even. And then yeah. I would say you know, twelve to eighteen months the EV uh, cost will be significantly cheaper than um, gas engine vehicles. Yeah. So I think parity has been pretty much been reached uh, um, you know, for the total ownership of EVs. Yeah. And I mean, are you sick? Because I mean, the, one of the big talking points at the moment is the kind of the the chip shortage, the, the logistical problems around the world. You know, it's affecting everyone around the world. It's not unique to any one country. But is that... Has that affected your manufacturing abilities, you know, or have you been able to work your way through that? Well, I think uh, you know, chip shortage is a uh, you know industry-wide problem. So yeah. you know, we along with other OEMs have been have been facing this issue for you know since I think the second quarter of last year. So uh, it is uh, uh, um issue that no one accepts. I mean, I don't think we. You know, sort of, uh, you know, can say that we're not impacted by that. Yeah. Um, but I think as a, a younger um, company with a sl- smaller um, delivery uh, numbers for for vehicles, we probably can deal with it more nimbly uh, for, yeah. uh, than some of the larger OEMs. Um, you know, we actually have been uh, quite aggressive in terms of uh, you know securing uh, alternative source of uh, suppliers uh, for right. chips. Uh, we we actually have spent a lot of effort try to develop um, uh, replacement parts uh, that could be used. Uh, so that take a month of effort to test our vehicles, and also um, you know because our you know what we need the quantity is is relatively manageable. I think uh, there's a you know more flexibility for us to secure that. So with all that effort, I think we have dealt with it probably better than some of the larger OEMs. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, we, we're still uh, impacted by the chip shortage uh, because it's not you know just one or two chips you can prepare for. It's probably uh, because our car, for example, uses over 2,000 chips yeah. in, the, in the vehicle. Um, uh, so any given time, there'll be, you know, uh, uh, you know, a few to a handful of chips that, that that seems to be in tight supply. We just need to be very nimble to deal with it. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, um, you know, I think we we are weathering it uh, to the as as best as we can. And, and the silver lining is that we think that chip shortage situation will start to improve. Yeah. Uh, in the second half of this year, and then um, it, it it will be a, a short term, I would say, uh, impact on the business. Yeah, because I mean, that is one of the concerns I've certainly had is that, you know, with everything that we've all gone through in the last couple of years, the, 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 there seemed to be such a clear, slow decline in costs involved in electric vehicles, you know, battery prices were dropping, the chips, you know, all the components for an electric car were getting cheaper. And then it suddenly feels like now, oh, well, maybe there's a, there's a going to be a hiccup, because right. the materials for batteries, you know, the prices of raw materials have gone up. It's going to affect the cost of batteries. It's going to affect the cost of the cars. I mean, is that something? Can you see? Because you did mention it earlier on. Can you see a continued trajectory of a slowly reducing cost for the vehicles themselves? Yeah, I think the the, the cost, uh, uh, continued cost improvements, a uh, cost down, uh, is pretty much uh, foreseeable uh, because. Uh, you know, you can see some of the major components of EVs like batteries. Uh, there are you know, cost advantages, uh, you know, with more uh, newer designs and more scale and capacity. 
uh, even though with some rising materials, but I think they'll be moving to cheaper uh, material mixes. So those are actually going to improve cost. Uh, other elements, for example, smart location costs, sensors, chips, uh, those are going to come down in price yeah. uh, in the future as well. So overall, I think you see the, the, the continued improvement uh, of EVs versus um, probably th there's a better chance for the EVs to improve in cost versus um, ICs because ICs has been so well developed over the, in yeah. the last few years. So there's not much you can do with the cost. But EV, I think there's a number of areas that you can see still continue the cost reductions. Yeah. Well, that's which is very encouraging because I mean that when it's 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 the comments that uh, you know that we receive all the time is you know from people I would love an electric car but I can't afford one yet <laughs> you know that's one of the most common things we hear and uh, you know it is that that initial price is still high but then there are ways around it you know I I lease my car I don't know if you know if, uh, if that's a common practice in China but it's certainly very common here because I couldn't afford to spend the entire lump sum in one go, you know, I couldn't, so I have to spread it out, but that, that works really well because the, as you yeah. say, the running costs are so much lower that the overall experience is cheaper. Yeah. We have a leasing business in China for our products as well. And also internationally, right. I think, uh, you know, flea sales are a very big part of European, you know, car sales. So, so we need to adapt to uh, these type of, um, you know, sort of marketing uh, practices and 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 I think those are um, also important because uh, no the smart EVs uh, we have actually a lot of different ways to monetize and and having a, a leasing and, and a monthly subscription model I think right. is actually you know pretty beneficial to our you know economics yeah yeah and then I mean the only other thing I would love to ask about China because that is su such a constant. Mm -hmm. uh, source of discussion here is the charging network. From what I can judge from Elliot, who works work, makes shows for us in in China, it's very different. You know, the, the the public charging network seems to be easy to use, reliable, ubiquitous. Yeah. It's all over the place. I don't know. I mean, because is that is that a concern of of uh, new drivers of electric cars in China? Do they say I don't know where I'm going to charge the car, or or they kind of know that? From day no, one. I think the charging infrastructure uh, has been a focus for Chinese government and also all the players um, in, in the EV. Um, I think the government has, you know, shifted um, from you know subsidy-driven incentives to uh, infrastructure build-out to you know to spur the growth of EVs. So they poured uh, billions of you know dollars into developing charging network. Uh, by, you know, obviously the state-owned companies, the Southern Grid, uh, the National Grid, State Grid, um, you know, they are building a massive number of uh, charging stations and charging piles. And also all the, uh, you know, charging, third-party charging companies, when they build a uh, uh, charging station, they get subsidies for charging stations. So, right. so there's a lot of the you know, programs supporting the build-out of charging infrastructure. And on top of that, a lot of the um, OEMs uh, like ourselves, like Tesla, uh, like Neo, uh, and some other uh, electric comp, you know, electric car companies, they are uh, all building proprietary or, or uh, charging networks. Right. So we actually, you know, have built uh, supercharging networks that span six hundred uh, locations over a few hundred cities. So right. you actually can get uh, very good proprietary tra charging. Um, so the you know experience for our um, you know drivers, um, yeah. all that will give us our give our drivers the highest um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, charge you know the the best charging technology, uh, right. the you know, highest confidence of you know the charging certainty because obviously we manage those sites. Yeah. Uh, we don't allow people to park randomly, and we want to make sure it's available to use. And also um, um, the piles, the technologies are service well. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we are doing you know, this kind of work to make sure, you know, our drivers have a, a good experience and certainty of charging. But at the same time, you know, our driver can charge in a few hundred thousand of, or, or million uh, different charging you know, stations around China because right. the availability of this infrastructure. So I think uh, uh, as we develop 
um, uh, I think we will see more uh, charging uh, infrastructure build out by the government, by the players, and by the OEMs. Yeah, it does sound a little bit more advanced than, than we are in the UK. I mean, we do have the, it is getting better here, but it's still it can be a struggle, you know. And it is what is interesting is as because this is what's happened in China and also in Norway. But as more and more people have electric cars. Yeah. You know, the charges that I wouldn't even think about worrying about using. I just go there and it was there and there was no one else there. I go there now and they're in use because there's so many more electric cars. We've had a really big increase here in numbers yeah. and not a big increase in the in not a big enough increase in the number of charges. We need a lot more. So that, that is a constant battle. But it, well, I didn't realize that XPeng effectively installed a charging network the same as Tesla have done. Or I, yeah, I knew yeah, we're network. doing that. Yeah. Right. And we only do supercharging. We don't do the normal slow no. charging. Sure. And also we want to make sure that our drivers uh, have uh, uh, access to high, um, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, advanced technology, uh, high uh, um, uh, so sort of certainty and also comfort um, for their charging. So that's yeah. why we put our own network. And I mean that you um, because presumably when you do that, like Tesla have done, you bypass all the problems of your mm. car communicating with a charger that it doesn't know. Because I mean that seems to be a has been a problem in the UK. Because that would be the that's the great joy of that system is you know the car and you know exactly. the charger and they work together very well. That's yeah, the, yeah. I mean, because uh, if I go to a third party station, uh, it, I mean, I actually had a lot of experience because I, I on a used, you know one weekends I drive to uh, uh, some hiking places and stuff. Um, you find a place that you know, some you you know you you you, you went there. Uh, either the pile doesn't work or the app is not working you cannot download it uh, you cannot actually you know register for it you cannot pay for it uh, the, there's cars parked in front of it uh, you cannot really charge right. uh, so there's a lot of these issues and yeah. then, uh, that's why I think we, we want to offer you know proprietary network so our drivers have the comfort of you know charge uncertainty yeah yeah. Now that sounds the other problems you have sound very familiar. That sounds that sounds quite like we have here. <laughs> yeah, I think it's probably it's pretty similar. I think it's the same all over the world, yeah. So then the 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 the, the next models then because I I'm, I've got to look up the next model. So the the one that's coming out later this year, I don't know, I need to look that up. But what what type of vehicle is that? The the one you mentioned right so, at the beginning, is it? Yeah, so we we're launching our fourth product, uh, which we call the G nine, right? Uh, which uh, um, you know a mid class, mid sized uh, SUV. Right. Uh, now I'm seeing it. Yes, I hadn't yeah, seen so, images of that before. Okay. So it's uh, let's say the size is similar to uh, X five BMW X five, yeah. Audi Q seven, and that sort of is the size that we're targeting. Uh, it's actually a very advanced product because it will be packed with the best in class technologies we develop in house. It will be our flagship product, so it will be more expensive than what we have been offering uh, in the past uh, because it's a premium, uh, it's an SUV, it's bigger in size. Um, and also, for example, we will have our latest um, uh, autonomous driving architecture, which we call right. Expedia 4.0 architecture. It will be the most advanced of its type in, in, when, when it launches. Uh, it will also have the charging platform that supports, uh, uh, it's an 800 volt uh, uh, charging platform. Support, sub, uh, it supports a 480 kilowatt charging uh, speed uh, that allows uh, you know, 200 kilometers worth of uh, a range in a matter of five minutes of wow. charge. Sorry, so, could you just just repeat that again? What's the what's the kilowatt speed? It's four hundred and eighty. Did you say four hundred and eighty kilowatts? Uh, wow, that's crazy. And then, wow. Um, and then and it will be a you know very fast charging. Yeah. Uh, so we are very excited about the product. We'll be launching um, later this year in China right. and delivering in China. But this is also a product that we developed with the international market in mind. So yeah. all the development specification is European, you know, standard. And, and we will be actually, uh, we have been starting from scratch, developing a European compliant uh, product. So right. we, we intend to uh, launch that also in Europe. So it will be a very nice product to uh, to fuel our product lines in the yeah. European 
No, that sounds, and that that is a, a an extraordinary achievement when you think of how recently f- fifty kilowatts was considered very fast, you know, right. and now you're at, you're at, no, close to five hundred kilowatts. You're talking about so and so that that the the range per mu- per minute of charging has got to be huge. The increase that that can yeah. take. That is truly that is very a uh, big game changer, and I think it's the way that a lot of people go. But you've definitely, I don't think there's, I've not heard of another vehicle, even in the coming that that can charge that fast. That does seem to be set a new, set a new level, hasn't it? Yeah. So I think that will, you know, we we for example, you know, our products want to really. You know, uh, every product will have a differentiated uh, uh, feature that that's really stands out. Yeah. Um, for example, our P5 that we're selling, it will be the first lighter incorporated in our sedan uh, product, right. you know, mass product, mass, mass mass produced products. So all of that, I think, point to really you know our our commitment to be technology based and 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 focus on really revolutionary um, product experience. Yeah, and I mean that the the that's because that is extraordinary in itself. The um the, the building a lidar into the car because I mean the only lidars I've ever seen have been a big thing on the roof. Yeah, that's the, the big one on the top. But no, yeah. we're we're actually using lidar in the in in, the, in what we call a supplement uh, sensor. So it will be much easier to uh, in terms of cost. Uh, also, you know. It, it will be fused into our uh, sort of perception algorithm, and, and uh, we are we are very, very excited. That allows us to have a wealth information to be safer and, and more um, uh, uh, higher, um, um, you know, more, more more enjoyable when we use yeah. these pump driving features. That is yes, no, that is extraordinary. And I mean, do you see that? So, in the long term, mm-hmm. do you see autonomous vehicles being? in a sense more like a taxi i mean that you wouldn't necessarily uh, this is a discussion i was having the other evening with an english with a, 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 a swedish manufacturer but it was about the, how you how we might own cars in the future or not own them but use them because if it's a fully autonomous vehicle and you can call it up and it comes to wherever you are in a sense that's such a huge advantage over what we have now you know that you can you can be, I mean, and, and the idea being that once you're in it, you drive it, but that the vehicle is, is as the, as yours sound like they already are, capable of effectively driving themselves. Yeah. Well, I think uh, it's not a robo-taxi yet. Uh, robo-taxi right. is obviously the next frontier. Uh, we actually are building uh, autonomous driving capabilities in our production vehicles that we sell to customers. Right. Um, so, so that's the near-term goal. And then we want to perfect it so it will be used in as many uh, uh, driving scenarios as possible from highway to city to parking garage. So we want to make sure that you know covers all of them. Um, I think in the long run, uh, obviously, there is a potential that this will lead to ultimate in a robo-taxi, which removes the driver. Yeah. I think that will, it will probably take a long time for that to happen because not only the technology needs to be, get there, but also need to um, um, uh, and understand the uh, uh, the government regulations and liability yeah. frameworks, and that will take time to build. Yeah, but that, I mean that in it is one of your long term aims, though. To, you're heading in that direction to to create vehicles that effectively can drive themselves. Is that? Is that a yeah, sort of long-term that, that goal? I think at some point, I think that that's what we think it's going to happen uh, in yeah. our vehicles, and I, I'm very excited that you know that we can actually achieve it. Yeah, um, it was, because one advantage we have is that we have so many cars on the road that has the sensor has been collecting data, uh, and um, and I think that this is uh, our advantage because we have more data that we can train our algorithm and to update our you know, sort of technology yeah. versus all the other players that have not really launched uh, similar products or right. with similar uh, data collecting capabilities. Right. And I mean, do you see, is there a, a, an area that you might go in that, is, that isn't cars? I'm thinking, you know, delivery vans, buses. I mean, are, are you dealing with any other vehicle types? Because, you know, that's clearly a very big growth area. 
Um, I think we will be dealing with uh, um, uh, other striving scenarios, but I think uh, the the key will be. Um, uh, well, I think right now our focus is still going to be passenger vehicles. Right. Uh, that's uh, where our, our autonomous driving uh, research can be focused on. But in the long run, I think uh, there's no reason not to think about potential scenarios that other driving conditions, so driving scenarios, so we use our products. Yeah, yeah. That is, I know, it's, it's really amazing. What I, I'm, I'm so impressed with how far you've come in such a short time. And, that, you know, I feel ashamed. I should have done the research. But, you know, the fact that there are models of cars you're bringing out that I hadn't seen before. I did know, I knew the, most of them, but the very newest, I hadn't seen images of that. I've now seen it. So it looks, it looks very impressive. You know, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it's extraordinary that it's so sophisticated. I can't help thinking of the you know, the long-term companies, you know, the, the European and North American companies who've been around for hundreds of years who spend decades developing a new model. <laughs> it takes them, and I'm just, I'm not talking about electric cars, just cars in general. You know, it's, it's a really long, slow process. And you are, it feels like you're bringing out a new model every year. I'm sure that isn't quite the case because I'm sure you've spent a long time developing them before they released. But you certainly have jumped forward very very far in a very short time thank you uh, yeah no it's a it's a very and very impressed and i'm you know i'm where this year i know we're going to be in uh various european countries because i have yet to see mm. up close and personal and certainly yet to drive a, an x-pen car but i'm really looking forward to it and we know, thankfully we know some people who've got them so it's, <laughs> we can go and visit someone who's got one, which is a thing I'm looking forward to. Well, that is really good. I mean, is there, is there any other aspects of what you're up to that you want to tell our listeners? I mean, is there any other announcements or things that are coming up soon? Um, well, I mean, obviously we are um, embarking on a, a very... Uh, I would say long-term strategy to build out our international presence. Yeah, uh, so we'll start to see that we are launching, um, you know, models uh, and marketing in 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 newer newer country and markets. Uh, that's something uh, will will come out uh, very soon. Uh, we're also gonna unveil our uh, sort of new models and technologies in upcoming, you know, sort of uh, auto shows. Right. Um, we, you know, the Beijing Auto Show is a big one that we'll be focused on, as well as some of the international ones uh, for us to launch internationally. So, so we're actually very excited. This year will be packed with a lot of, you know, surprises and excitements yeah. for us. Uh, we are very uh, excited to see uh, new products and also new markets uh, to be launched. So, so stay tuned. Yeah, no, we absolutely will, and it's it's a really you're a very exciting company to follow. It's it's hard to keep up with what you're doing, but thank you so much, Brian. It's been really good to talk to you and to catch up with you, and 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 good luck with all your future future endeavors. It's it's a really a really impressive what you've been doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's very nice speaking to you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed that. It was short, but sweet. it was very, very late at night for for, for Dr. Brian. And, uh, and so, you know, a bit of a, a challenge. So it was there, it, they chose the time. I think he's incredibly busy and it's very difficult to, to find a gap. So I'm really grateful to uh, all the, the team at Xpeng for arranging that because that was, you know, a real privilege. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing what they do in future. Really impressive, really impressive. Anyway, that's enough. Uh, do, you know, the old subscriber, I haven't mentioned subscribing or Patreon or uh, telling your friends about these podcasts would be, we'd, we'd love that. Uh, please do spread the word um we've got a lot more coming up that are very interesting with some amazing people so you know stay tuned as we used to say in the olden days when everything was black and white and uh that's it as always if you have been thank you for listening <laughs>